This is a pre-recorded presentation, so the presenter will not be taking any questions. However, all questions asked during the live presentation, along with answers, are included at the end of this presentation. To learn more about our upcoming patient and family conferences in your area, please visit aamds.org slash conferences. To view other recorded presentations or to register for other live online learning events, please visit aamds.org slash learn. Welcome to our live webinar titled, The PNH Patient's Journey, A Snapshot of Short and Long-Term Effects. Thank you for joining us. My name is Angie Onerfe, Director of Patient Education at AMDSIS, and I'll be moderating the presentation today. As we get started, I would like to acknowledge Achillean Pharmaceuticals and Genentech for providing educational grants to help support this webinar program. Today's presenter is Pierce Burns. Pierce Burns has been a nurse at John Hopkins, uh, John Hopkins University Oncology Center since graduating from nursing school. She initially worked in the outpatient chemotherapy infusion center specializing in head and neck and esophageal cancer. She now works as a certified registered nurse practitioner in the Department of Hematologic Malignancy specializing in aplastic anemia, MDS, AML, and bone marrow transplant. With that said, it is my pleasure to welcome Pierce. Hi, everybody. Welcome, and thank you very much for having me. As uh, Angie very nicely said during that nice introduction, the topic of today's discussion is that of paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, which is a bit of a mouthful, I know, so we're going to go with PNH from here on out. By the end of this discussion, you will, I hope, understand the relationship between PNH and aplastic anemia, learn what you can do to better manage common, common symptoms and side effects, and learn questions that you should ask your doctor. I'm going to start with what is PNH, and I'm going to apologize from the outset. Some of these slides, I think, come from my background as a nurse practitioner. I've tried to put them in lay terms, but at the end, as Angie said, it will be time for questions, so if anything comes up, feel free to ask me at the end. But what is PNH? PNH is a rare clonal hematopoietic stem cell disease. That's what you will hear every time you ask, which is really just a fancy way of saying that it is a disease that arises from the grandparents, the stem cells, of all of our blood cells. It can arise de novo, so basically out of nowhere, or in the setting of aplastic anemia, and it typically presents with any combination of bone marrow failure, hemolytic anemia, smooth muscle dystonias, which I'll get into a little bit more, or thrombosis, clots. Most, most importantly, thanks to a lot of work that has been done in the area over the last 10 years, is a disease that can be treated and controlled, and in some very specific cases, even cured. What PNH is not? It's a little bit of a misnomer. So actually, it's not really paroxysmal, despite the name. Even in the absence of symptoms, the destructive process of the hemolysis, the cell breakdown, is ongoing. Nor is it really nocturnal, as the hemolysis, while often subtle, is nonetheless very constant and occurs 24-7. And last but not least, despite being in the name, hemoglobinuria is actually not particularly a common complication. It is really only a presenting symptom in about a quarter of the patients. In terms of epidemiology, as I mentioned, it's a little bit of a more rare disease. It's not common. The incidence is about 1 to 1.5 cases per million worldwide. There is actually a higher incidence of it in the Asian countries, so Japan, China, and Korea, versus the Western countries of the United States, United Kingdom, and France. It appears also that the clinical manifestations differ in the different regions. PNH-related thrombotic events, the, the clots, are actually seen more frequently in the Western countries, whereas in the Asian countries, we tend to see fewer of the clots, but more of those symptoms that come out of bone marrow failure or aplastic anemia, as the rate of PNH arising from aplastic anemia is higher in those Asian countries. In terms of diagnosis, PNH continues to be primarily truly a clinical diagnosis that we confirm by something called peripheral blow flood cytometry. The signs and the symptoms are very variable and often mimic other conditions, so as a result, there's often a delay in the diagnosis, on average greater than three years and sometimes up to 10 years. So who do we screen? Well. We screen anybody who presents with a Coombs-negative hemolytic anemia, patients with aplastic anemia, 
refractory anemia, and patients who present with unexplained thrombosis in conjunction with cytopenias, low blood counts, or hemolysis. The workup for PNH will involve a number of laboratory tests, including a complete blood count, something called a reticulocyte count, LDH, Coombs test, and often we will do bone marrow biopsies just to evaluate for any underlying bone marrow failure. There is one test, though, that has become the mainstay in confirming the diagnosis of PNH, and that is flow cytometry, as I mentioned before. This is a peripheral blood test that involves staining the cells. So we draw the cells and we send them off to the pathologist and they put a special stain on them. Once those stain, that stain is applied, the hemato hematopathologist will be able to see what percentage of the cells are missing or deficient in something called a GPI anchored protein. And I will get into that shortly. Once they determine this, they come up with a percentage of the missing proteins, and that is what is known as the PNH clone. Several years ago, a classification scheme was developed by the International PNH Interest Group, and it includes three main categories. We have classical PNH, which includes the hemolytic and the thrombotic patients who have no underlying bone marrow failure. We have PNH in the context of other primary bone marrow failure disorders, such as aplastic anemia or myelodysplastic syndrome, MDS. And we have subclinical PNH, patients who have small PNH clones, but no clinical or laboratory evidence of hemolysis or thrombosis. However, I should say, most patients don't actually fall easily into any one of these distinct categories. It's nice to have them, but it's not always clear cut as virtually all PNH cases have a degree of underlying bone marrow failure. So there, as you can see, a great deal of overlap in many of these disorders. I think to truly understand PNH as a disease, I'm sorry to say, we need to review the pathophysiology and the mechanisms of the disorder. And I should note, this talk actually could be a talk unto itself, but I've tried in this case to just cover the basics. As I mentioned before, PNH is what we call an acquired clonal hematopoietic stem disease, so coming out of the grandfather stem cells. All of our cells are known to have a group of proteins affixed to their surface by something called a GPI anchor. There are a multitude of these proteins on all of our cells, but for our purposes here, we care about only two of them, something called a CD55 and a CD59. And we care about them because it is these two proteins that are responsible for the regulation of something called the complement system. In PNH, we have discovered that these cells somehow have acquired a genetic mutation that is called the pig A, and this mutation causes a deficiency of both CD55 and CD59. And it's the loss of these two proteins that make those cells susceptible to something called intravascular or within the cell and extravascular outside of the cell hemolysis or breakdown. And it is this breakdown process that causes the primary manifestations of this disease. So what is the complement system? Well, the complement system is a vital component of our natural or innate protective immune system. It is activated by three mechanisms or pathways called the classical, alternative, and electin. And these pathways allow the system to respond to various situations in the body. So inflammatory, infectious, ischemic, or necrotic situations, as well as the foreign and self antigens. Because such situations require such a rapid response, the complement system is always on or amped up, if you will, and ready to respond. And I'm sorry, this may look a little scientific, but I am someone that needs a visual. And so you see here the three different pathways that I just talked about. And the CD59 right there. Under normal circumstances, we have natural inhibitors, those GPI proteins that I mentioned, CD55 and CD59. They keep this amplification in check and they prevent control, uncontrolled complement activi activation. But in PNH, those natural inhibitors, CD55 and CD59, are actually missing 
And without them, that amplification of the immune response system goes unchecked, leading to responses that are very powerful and rather than helpful are actually very destructive. It is this state of continuous unchecked complement activation that leads to the destruction of the red cells, both intravascular and extravascular. And it is the effects from the destruction of these cells that lead to the manifestations of PNH. So what are these specific clinical manifestations of PNH? In general, the symptoms are, as I mentioned, hemoglobinuria, which is actually less common than all the other symptoms, anemia, pancytopenia, which just means low blood counts across the board, and this is usually seen in the setting of an underlying bone marrow failure, thrombosis, which are clots, abdominal pain, transient impotence, esophageal spasm, fatigue, and central nervous system changes. So let's talk about a few of these more common side effects in more detail. Anemia is probably the most common side effect, obviously, and one that is most attributed to PNH. It is often multifactorial, meaning different reasons, and usually results from a combination of hemolysis and bone marrow failure. In patients with classical PNH, the anemia is typically moderate to severe and due to an underlying hemolytic process or a breakdown of the cells that is a result of the complement attack on the red blood cells. These patients usually present with an elevated reticulocyte count, an elevated LDH, and a large PNH clone, typically about greater than 50%. In some patients, though, with an overlap of the aplastic anemia, as you can see on the right side, the anemia is actually primarily due to the underlying primary bone marrow failure. These patients typically, if you look in their marrow, they have hypocellular bone marrow, which means that they have too few cells, more severe thrombocytopenia, and smaller PNH clones. Patients with anemia, regardless of the etiology, often experience fatigue, generalized weakness, lightheadedness or dizziness, heart racing, and headaches. The next common symptom is that of thrombosis or clots, blood clots. This unfortunately is a very common and very ominous complication of PNH. It occurs in about 40% of the patients and is often the presenting symptom. It leads to severe morbidity and is often the most common cause of mortality in PNH. The clots may occur at any site, but venous thrombosis, thrombosis in the veins, is much more common than arterial. Those who actually have a larger percentage of PNH clone are actually at the highest risk. Once the thrombosis occurs, we treat it with anticoagulation and ecoluzumab, which I will get into shortly. It's not clear why, but the most common sites of these clots include in the intra-abdominal, so in the abdominal area, the hepatic, portal, mesenteric, and splenic veins, as well as the cerebral vein, which is the, namely the sagittal and cavernous sinus. The most common site of thrombosis actually is in, near the liver in the big hepatic portal vein, which is also known, you'll hear it called, the Bud Chiari syndrome. Regardless of where the clot is, though, patients who develop any type of thrombosis are initially treated with anticoagulation and started on ecoluzumab. One would think, actually, that given the increased risk for clots in these patients, that we would start prophylactic anticoagulation to prevent the clots. But interestingly, what we have discovered is that primary prophylaxis actually has not proven to be beneficial in this population. And it's also not entirely clear if lifelong coagulation is necessary for secondary prophylaxis in PNH patients who are well controlled on ecolizumab. The next set of manifestations is that of what we call smooth muscle dystonias. These tend to be more common in patients with classical PNH or those patients who have a larger PNH clone and no underlying bone marrow failure, although certainly they can occur in any patients with the overlap syndromes. The symptoms are a result of what we call intravascular hemolysis. This causes the release of something called free hemoglobin, 
In non-PNH patients, this free hemoglobin is cleared by various mechanisms. But in PNH patients, those mechanisms are actually overwhelmed by the PNH, which results in a high level of free hemoglobin in the plasma, and this free hemoglobin scavenges or scoops up a substance called nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is important because its main job is to maintain smooth muscle relaxation and to inhibit platelet activation. So when we have a deficiency in that nitric oxide, we see symptoms of abdominal pain or spasm or dysphagia or erectile dysfunction because we don't have the ability to control that. Other manifestations of PNH that are a little bit less common include chronic kidney disease. So patients with PNH are actually at a significantly higher risk for chronic kidney disease, which is a result of renal tubular damage, so damage to the renal tubes, that is caused by microvascular thrombosis, little baby clots that accumulate in the tubes, and accumulation of iron deposits. They are also at risk for mild to moderate pulmonary hypertension, and often the fatigue and dis dyspnea or shortness of breath, which we usually attribute to anemia, is also the result of raised pulmonary pressures and reduced cardiac function, which again is caused by these little tiny subclinical microclots. What is the treatment for PNH? Historically, treatments were generally conservative and supportive and consisted simply of transfusions, anticoagulants, <clears throat> supplements of folic acid and iron, steroids, and androgen hormones. Doesn't sound so fun. Allogeneic bone marrow transplant, which was at the time curative in about 50% of the patients, was also associated with high treatment-related mortality and with significant rates of both acute and chronic graft-versus-host disease. Fortunately, we've stepped it up a notch. In 2004, it was discovered that complement inhibition is a highly effective way therapy of treating classical PNH. Three significant studies in 2004, 2006, and 2008 resulted in FDA approval of a complement inhibitor called ecoluzumab or Solaris. So the current treatment now consists of ecoluzumab and, when indicated, allogeneic bone marrow transplant. So what is ecoluzumab? And sorry, another scientific slide. I should say ecoluzumab actually is a talk unto itself as well. But in brief, it is something that we call a humanized monoclonal antibody that binds specifically to something called C5. In doing this, it blocks the activity of the terminal complement pathway, one of those pathways that we talked about earlier, but allowing the proximal functions of the complement to, retain, to remain intact. So in other words, it blocks part of the immune system but lets some of it remain normal. The important thing about ecoluzumab is that it complements for that CD59 deficiency, but actually not for the CD55 deficiency. So it only treats half of what the PNH problems are. So while it is effective in treating the intravascular hemolysis and PNH, most PNH patients on ecoluzumab will continue to experience some sort of degree of extravascular hemolysis. PNH is the only FDA-approved therapy for classical PNH, and it is also used in other patients with the overlap symptoms to reduce the effect of hemolysis and also to treat acute thrombotic events. Treatment with ecolizumab starts with a loading period of four weekly doses. And during this time, we monitor that CBC, complete blood count, reticulocyte counts, LDH, and CMP weekly. And then following this loading period, patients then move to maintenance therapy, which includes ecoluzumab every other week indefinitely with lab work done monthly. Most patients tolerate this very well. The only main side effect typically is that of headaches, which is developed within the first week of the treatment. And then as the treatment goes on, those actually resolve and patients have no side effects or symptoms. So what does the ecolizumab do exactly? Well, as I mentioned, it's something called a monoclonal antibody 
and it is extremely effective in stopping that intravascular hemolysis, which decreases or even eliminates the need for red blood cell transfusions. It actually improves quality of life by decreasing the amount of fatigue and treating those symptoms of smooth muscle dystonias, <clears throat> the esophageal spasms, abdominal pain, dysphagia, and erectile dysfunction. Last but not least, it reduces the risk of thrombosis by about 90%, and in conjunction with anticoagulation, it helps treat those acute thrombotic events. The time frame for symptom improvement on ecolizumab is actually relatively quick. Symptoms of fatigue, esophageal spasm, abdominal pain, and erectile dysfunction are typically reduced within one week of the initiation of treatment. And usually within two to six months, we will see a stabilization in the red cell counts with reduction or even cessation of the number of transfusions required. What does ecolizumab not do? Well, it does not fix the actual genetic defect from which this disease arises. So cessation of the treatment with ecolizumab will lead to recurrence of the presenting symptoms. Because it does not compensate for that CD55 deficiency, it will not treat the extravascular hemolysis. So people will still, again, have symptoms from that. It does not improve or fix primary bone marrow dysfunction, such as that seen in aplastic anemia. So patients who have the overlap of PNH and aplastic anemia will continue to have low white cell counts, platelets, and red cell counts. Important things to think of when people are on, patients are on ecolizumab therapy. To maintain a sustained response, ecolizumab must be administered indefinitely, i.e. lifelong. And because the medication provides a lifelong blockade of the terminal complement, patients receiving ecolizumab are at a high risk of developing certain infections, namely those in something called the Neisseria family, i.e. meningitis or gonorrhea. So, all of our patients who receive this medication must be vaccinated against Neisseria with something called the meningococcal vaccine, and ideally we administer this two weeks prior to starting treatment and then every three to five years. In the event of severe PNH cases, especially patients who present with acute thrombosis, administration of ecolizumab and vaccination can be done on the same day, and in these cases, we will start the patient on prophylactic therapy with an antibiotic called ciprofloxacin, and we will continue them on that for about two weeks. Some clinicians also like to add penicillin prophylaxis. You'll hear PenVK is the standard, although this has not actually been formally studied. The other treatment for PNH is that of bone marrow transplant. While initially bone marrow transplant sounds like the way to go because it does truly represent the only potential and a highlight potential for cure, it actually should never be the first line treatment in patients with classical PNH because while we have come a long way in our bone marrow treatment, the risks for transplant related morbidity and mortality are still very high and very real. And lifelong treatment of ecolizumab every other week, while not always convenient and not fun, is actually preferred over the potential for chronic DVHD or even death, which are very real risks from bone marrow transplant. However, bone marrow transplant is the appropriate treatment for certain patients, namely those with an aplastic anemia and PNH overlap. Patients who meet criteria for severe aplastic anemia with a PNH clone are very good candidates for a bone marrow transplant if they have a suitable match and no significant comorbidities. In certain cases with classical PNH patients, bone marrow transplant is used only when those patients have failed to respond to ecolizumab or in certain countries, ecolizumab is actually not available and bone marrow transplant is used in patients then. We've actually come a very long way with bone marrow transplant, and we now recognize that a myeloablative, or what used to be called a maxi transplant, 
conditioning regimen, which means basically we wipe out the entire immune system, is actually not required to wipe out the clone. So more often than not, we are now using what we call a reduced intensity conditioning regimen, which essentially means no, much less toxicity. In addition, many of the big transplant centers have become much more adept at graft-versus-host disease prophylaxis. And so many, there are actually ongoing clinical trials using haploidentical or half-match donors when matched sibling donors are not available. The decision of when to treat depends typically on the clinical situation of the patient. There's actually no widely accepted evidence-based parameter for when to start treatment, but in general, for classical PNH, treatment with ecolizumab typically is started on patients who present with disabling fatigue, acute thromboses, transfusion dependence, frequent pain paroxysms, renal insufficiency, or other end organ complications. For those patients who have an, an overlap of aplastic anemia and PNH, treatment initially is actually directed at the underlying bone marrow failure with careful monitoring of PNH clone via flow cytometry. So those who meet criteria for severe aplastic anemia, anemia sorry, are managed actually with IST or immunosuppressive therapy, usually ATG plus cyclosporin or atacrolimus or when appropriate, bone marrow transplant. For those who are asymptomatic or have very low-grade symptoms, a watchful weight paradigm is usually adopted. I would actually like to do a case presentation, and I apologize for not having a slide, but her case came together a little too late to create it. But I actually think her course really encapsulates this entire talk. I met her a few weeks ago, and she is a lovely 24-year-old female who was initially diagnosed with aplastic anemia back in 2004. And at the time, she had a very small PNH clone. Given the aplastic anemia, she was treated with intermittent courses of immunosuppressive therapy. She got a couple of doses of ATG and cyclosporin over the years, and managed to put everything in remission and get what we call a partial response, meaning she gained periods of transfusion independence. But throughout the year, she had a slow evolution to PNH, so the PNH clone continued to grow. She was referred to us several weeks ago for consideration of a bone marrow transplant using her sister, who is a half match, as a donor, because we actually have a trial here for half matches. Unfortunately, when she met us, she actually did not meet criteria for severe aplastic anemia. Her platelet count, while low, was actually stable, around 30,000. She was not neutropenic, so not truly immunosuppressed. Her neutrophil count was above 500, and her reticulite site, reticulite site count was normal. In the process of working her up for her transplant, however, she developed acute abdominal pain. And initially, she kept telling us that she thought this was her normal menstrual cramping, maybe a little bit worse than normal, but that's what she thought it was. But the pain actually progressed to the point where we ultimately ended up having to admit her for further workup. And in the process of that workup, we discovered that the pain was actually due to a big clot in her hepatic vein, and she also had an incidental finding of a clot in her pulmonary, a pulmonary embolus. At that point, her PNH clone was quite large, and so this was all consistent with a PNH attack. We, she was promptly started on ecolizumab in addition to Xarelto for anticoagulation. And as we mentioned, because we were unable to vaccinate her first, she was also put on a 14-day course of Cipro. At this point, she has now completed her loading dose period of the ecolizumab and is receiving it as maintenance every two weeks and is actually doing much better. Her pain has completely resolved. She is now off Xarelto. She is back to work and actually really living quite the normal life. Unfortunately, she still has her underlying bone marrow failure, which the ecolizumab is not treating, from her aplastic anemia. And so she does remain transfusion dependent. So we see her every two weeks for her ecolizumab, and she usually requires one to two units each every other week as well.
Her counts are still stable, but they are starting to drift down. So ultimately, I think probably within the next few months, we'll end up transplanting her maybe this summer or early fall using her sister as a donor. So in summary, after that long talk, PNH, once again, is what we call a rare clonal hematopoietic stem cell disease that arises from a mutation of a pig A gene that leads to a loss of complement, causing intravascular and extravascular hemolysis. It usually presents with bone marrow failure, hemolytic anemia, smooth muscle dystonias, and thrombosis. Treatment, it consists of ecolizumab for classical PNH, and for those with an overlap of PNH and aplastic anemia who have thrombosis issues, and also bone marrow transplant for bone marrow failure and lack of response to ecolizumab. Thank you very much for your time. I hope I've answered some of your questions, and I'm happy to take any questions. All right. Thank you, Pierce, for your very wonderful presentation. We did get a variety of questions, I mean, while you were presenting. Uh, our first question comes from David, and David would like to know, what is a quote-unquote dangerous level of PNH cells? <laughs> well, David, great question. There is no defined level per se of a percentage of a PNH cell. What we worry more about is the clinical presentation of each patient, so when we become worried are when they develop those acute thromboses, because that is something we don't want them to do, or if they have the overlap syndrome with the aplastic anemia and are neutropenic, so their immune system is not functioning well and they are much more prone to infection, that is when we usually will start to think about treatment. Does that answer the question? Yes. All right. Thank you. Uh, our next question comes from Amy. Amy would like to know, besides aplastic anemia, are there any other diseases PNH patients should be tested for? No. The, the other overlap syndrome with PNH aplastic anemia is a myelodysplastic syndrome, which is another primary bone marrow failure. And I actually do have a patient who has, uh, she initially was diagnosed with a moderate aplastic anemia many, many years ago that never required any treatment. But over the years, her PNH clone, she had a very small PNH clone at diagnosis. And over the years, that clone has started to progress or grow. And her counts have started to drop. So we actually just did a bone marrow biopsy on her, and she now has a myelodysplastic syndrome. Um, but PNH patients, this is why we watch the levels as closely as we do. It's monthly when you're on the ecolizumab. And even if you're in the watchful weight paradigm, your your clinician is going to check that PNH clone throughout the year, and you're going to check your blood levels throughout the year, and those are going to be our indicators if we have to do anything further. All right, thank you. Our next question comes from Mike. Mike would like to know, with blood clots being a concern for PNH patients, how do you uh, how do doctors monitor patients for blood clots? Another great question without a great answer because there is no way to actually monitor for them short of doing full body ultrasounds all the time, which there is absolutely no indication for. And again, as I said, you would think with PNH patients that we would do prophylactic um, anticoagulation, but there have been studies done on that, and it actually has not shown to be of any benefit. When the clot is truly caused by the PNH, and it's a result of that whole complement system that I probably didn't explain all that well, but when those clots develop, the anticoagulation actually isn't even as effective. What you need is something like the ecolizumab that is going to go to the root cause of the clot, which is that complement. And that is the way that we treat them. All right. Thank you. Our next question uh, comes from Simone. And Simone would like to know, what are the known short and long-term effect side effects of Solaris? There really are none. Um, the short-term side effects, as I mentioned, the most common is that of a headache. And that typically disappears within the first two doses of Solaris. It's actually proven to be exceptionally safe and very effective. Because it's a relatively new drug, there are no real published studies of, how, of patients who have been on it for, I think, more than 10 years at this point, although they are starting to look back retrospectively. But patients tolerate it very well, and they stay on it as long as they 
as long as they don't show any progression towards an underlying bone marrow failure or something else that would require us to step it up to a bone marrow transplant. All right, thank you. Our next question comes from Brett. Brett would like to know, can a patient stop Solaris and then return to be treated with Solaris? Yes, you can stop it. However, your symptoms for sure are going to come back. Um, And there are, we don't recommend stopping it, actually. Um, You can come back to it, but your chance for everything to have grown in in the interim is a little bit higher. So, Typically, again, I know it's not the best to have to get this every other week, but that is the standard, and it seems to be working. I will say, and I don't have much to comment on this, there are actually some studies going on of some other medications looking also at targeting different areas of the complement system. Those studies are ongoing, so I don't know if in the future there'll be some sort of therapy that is maybe a little less time intensive and not lifelong, but that has not been established yet. All right. Thank you. Our next question comes from Becky. Becky would like to know, is Solaris safe during pregnancy? Yes, it is, actually. Um, And pregnant women with PNH have actually an even greater need for, well, we just need to make sure that they get folic acid and iron supplementation because you are having that intravascular hemolysis. Um, so at times you can do the ecolizumab, but you may need to supplement with the intravenous iron. Um, I will say that pregnancy with oral birth control pills, if you're on those, that increases the risk of thrombosis. But no, actually, my one of our physicians here, he will treat pre- patients who are pregnant with ecolizumab. All right, thank you. Uh, Our next question comes from Lee. Uh, Lee would like to know, for patients who still require blood transfusions and are being treated with Solaris, what are the options? Well, I can't comment entirely on that without knowing a little bit more background, Um, but typically if that patient has not met criteria for the severe aplastic anemia, then we just continue to transfuse because that's actually relatively safe. I know we there's always talk about iron overload, but there are ways to actually manage the iron overload and continue the Solaris. Bone marrow transplant, as I mentioned, people love to talk about bone marrow transplant as being sort of an, I'll use the word easy way out. I don't think that's quite the appropriate way. But bone marrow transplant has a lot of risk attached to it. And so we are very thoughtful when we decide to take a patient from Solaris onto a bone marrow transplant. All right. Thank you. Our next question comes from Camille. Uh, Camille would like to know, could you please elaborate on how the central nervous system changes in relation to PNH? Um, Yes. It's actually, I put that in there. It's actually one of the less common side effects. It's actually not one that I have seen seen here in my practice regularly, but it is mentioned in the literature, so I really wanted to comment on that. Um, I think it's mostly in the form of headaches. Some people can get some confusion, but it's it's relatively rare. It is not the central nervous system that you can get um, when you talk about other diseases as, as such as AML and lymphoma, where they tr- have true deficits in terms of strength and mobility, et cetera. It's more subtle, such as the headaches. All right, thank you. Uh, our next question comes from Maya. Maya would like to know, when should a PNH patient seek medical help if they are not feeling well? So my answer to my patients when they ask me that question is if you are not feeling well, the best thing to do is to call your clinician and let us triage and suss out whether it is something to be worried about and if it is something that we need to manage or change your treatment for. All right, thank you. Our next question comes from Robert. Robert would like to know, how do doctors determine when a PNH patient should start treatment with Solaris? Uh, so treatment, we decide to start treating with patients who are profoundly symptomatic. So first of all, I should say, if you present with a thrombosis, a clot of anywhere, that is an automatic indication to start Solaris. Otherwise, it is we started on patients who truly have this disabling fatigue. The transfusion dependence is really racking up. 
pain, people who would start to develop all the pain, and people who are just generally very symptomatic. All right, thank you. Our next question comes from Paul. Paul would like to know, can you please define a reticulocyte? <laughs> um, a reticulocyte is just a, a a baby red blood cell that we monitor. All right, thank you. Uh, our next question is from Lee. Lee would like to know, if a patient had a bone marrow transplant for aplastic anemia, do they still need to be concerned about PNH? Very typically, no, because typically the bone marrow transplant, because we are actually changing the biology of the disease by switching out one immune system for a more healthy immune system, no. But post-transplant, we will actually check the for the PNH clone. We typically don't see it. All right. Thank you. Uh, our next question comes from Susan. Susan would like to know, is there any information on how to treat the disabling fatigue that occurs as often as every two weeks and sometimes lasting uh, three weeks? Um, and she's currently on uh, Solaris. Oh, Fatigue is one of those really hard symptoms because there's no hard and fast way to fix it. You would, We would hope that the Solaris would help. I don't know how long you have been on it. Even though I said that the response time is relatively quick, there are some outlier patients where it actually does take several months of treatment to for the, for the symptoms to fully abate. My other answer for fatigue is not an easy one, and it's easy for me to say, speaking on this phone and sitting on my stool, but the one, the only real way to combat fatigue is to push yourself a little bit and make sure that you're remaining as active as you can during the day, but still allowing yourself to take some naps because that's your body saying that it needs to rest. Um, but the more you rest, the more you profligate the fatigue. Again, not a great answer. All right, thank you. Uh, our next question comes from Laura. Laura wants to give you a shout out for a great talk. Um, and she also says if aplastic anemia presents without a PNH clone, can one develop uh, over the course of the disease? And if so, when would you recheck an aplastic anemia patient for a PNH clone if one wasn't present at diagnosis? The answer is yes. In some cases, you can. And actually, in aplastic anemia, we check for PNH clones sometimes yearly. I would say every six months to a year. Okay. And certainly, if the apl so aplastic anemia and it was hard in this talk because aplastic anemia is really also a talk unto it of itself. Because it is an underlying bone marrow failure, there are so many other little factors that you have to consider. But certainly, so if I had a patient with an aplastic anemia and who was all of a sudden developing clots or these weird upticks in pain that are not necessarily consistent with a straight up aplastic anemia, I might think along the lines of PNH developing and check for a PNH clone at that point. All right, thank you. Uh, our next question comes from Lewis. Lewis would like to know, I have heard of rare cases of the PNH clone disappearing. Have you ever encountered this? Yes. Very rarely, but yes, actually. They will sometimes disappear or even become small enough that they don't become problematic. Nobody really knows why or how that happens, um, but yes, it can happen. It's rare. All right. All right. Thank you. Uh, our next question uh, comes from David. David would like to know, is there a typical level of clones uh, when you begin to see thrombosis? Again, no. There's been no definitive level or percentage of a PNH clone that we know that will trigger thrombosis. We do know that the larger the clone, the more high risk you are, but there's no specific number where we truly become, we say, oh, this patient is at much higher risk than we thought for uh, thrombosis. Uh, 
All right, thank you. Uh, our next question comes from Paul. Paul would like to know, are there people for whom ecolizumab is not appropriate or doesn't work well? Yes. Um It does not work well. So obviously, if you have the underlying bone marrow failure, it is not going to fix all of the problems, and it may not work as well for all of the symptoms and the side effects that are caused by that actual underlying bone marrow. And there are some outliers that actually do not respond to ecolizumab, those classical PNH people who initially presented with no underlying bone marrow failure and just the thrombosis or the, hem the hemolysis. There are some outliers that don't respond to Solaris, and those are the patients that if the, the symptoms are really significant, that then we do think about maybe taking them to a bone marrow transplant. All right, thank you. Uh, our next question comes from Lewis, and Lewis actually has two questions. Um, the first question is, given the excessive costs of Solaris and insurance companies' reluctance to cover expensive costs, what can be done to help young PNH patients who will need it for such a long-term period or for their entire life? So, I first of all, I should say that I do not work for Alexion. I have no affiliation with them. However, I that is one thing that the company is very good about, is trying to get ecolizumab at a cost that is palatable for people. And so they have many, they have representatives that will work with individual patients to make that happen. I have several patients that the insurance did not cover it, and um, Alexion stepped up, and it requires a lot of paperwork, I, but we are more than willing to do it, and they, they will get it for the patients. But you're right, the cost is incredible, and that, that is one issue with that medication. All right, thank you. And Lewis's second question was, uh, have you seen many classical PNH patients that, involve, that evolve into AML or MDS? Less so with the AML, more so with the MDS, yes. Um, they tend to be slightly older patients, and again, nobody really knows what causes that evolution. It happens at the level of the chromosomes, and there is just, again, you already have that genetic defect, and then something else triggers that bone marrow failure that it makes you evolve into the MDS. It, it's a little bit less rare for MDS than it is for aplastic anemia. All right, thank you. Our next question comes from Gail. Gail would like to know, is there a connection to PNH and an increased likelihood of inflammation? Only in the sense that the complement system, which I talked about before, helps regulate inflammation within the body. So when the complement system is disrupted or continually on, there's no mechanism for the body to combat that inflammation. Um, that's really the, the, the most direct effect that I can tell you about. All right, thank you. Uh, our next question comes from Susan. Susan would like to know, is there information on how effective prednisone is in short term for treating uh, disabilitating fatigue that often occurs um, when they're infused with Solaris? So prednisone actually used to be one of the mainstays of the treatment because we didn't really have anything else. And it is still used by some clinicians to varying degrees of effects. Short term, sure, it seems to help because it reduces inflammation. It gives you a little bit of a spark, makes you feel good. But long-term treatment with any type of steroid like that really leads to long-term effects that are much less pleasant. All right, thank you. And I believe we have one more question, and our last question is from... Sanjeev, and Sanjeev is from India. Oh, hi. Um, he, is, <laughs> he is a PNH patient with a 90% negative cell. Um, he would like to know your thoughts of whether he should go, you know, or explore a bone marrow transplant. So, again, without knowing, and I apologize, but without knowing the specifics of your disease and what your counts are and how you are feeling, I can't comment fully on that. Um, 
and I don't know how long you've been on the ecolizumab and how well you are feeling on it, but I will say if you're on ecolizumab, your transfusions are decreasing and you're feeling okay, my recommendation is probably to stay on that for as long as you can. All right. I believe those are all the questions that we uh, got. Once again, thank you, Pierce, for your wonderful presentation and for your time. I would also just like to add that if you would like to rewatch this webinar at a later time, please be on the lookout for an email that will provide you with an archive link within four to seven business days. On behalf of the Aplastic Anemia and MDS International Foundation, I would like to thank each and every one of you for joining us today and making us your resource of choice for information on bone marrow failure diseases. If we were not able to answer your question today, please send it to us via email at help, that's H-E-L-P, at aamds.org so that our patient educator can respond, or visit our online academy at aamds.org slash learn for interviews with experts and other programs that may address your question. As a reminder, as soon as I'm done speaking, a post-event survey will appear requesting your feedback. We appreciate your time to complete this survey. Again, thank you for joining us, and remember, learning is hope. This concludes today's program.